So, uh, Ikwe, uh, Joe, has been here for uh, a little over a year now, working as a research scholar in the Conrad's Research Center and applying to the Department of Statistics. So she received her PhD in 2011 from UNC Chapel Hill and uh, has a master's in applied mathematics from UMBC in 2007, I believe. And she's been working kind of at the interface of applied math and statistics and biological sciences. And most of her applied work has been, in, or much of her applied work has been in toxicogenomics. So she's been working a lot the last year on the GTEx project, which is really a large multi-investigator consortium thing where I'm happy to say that we just submitted <clears throat> the first paper from this huge project uh, in, I don't know, maybe last Saturday or something like that. Um, so anyway, without further ado, uh, she's going to talk more about her methods work and kind of the areas that, that these can be applied to. Thank you. Oh, by the way, she entirely lost her voice. <laughs> And, which I found out this morning, and we're seeing what modern technology can, can do to make up for that, but I didn't have time for a Stephen Hawking type solution, so <laughs> we'll see how this goes. Thank you, Dr. Wright, for your introduction, and uh, welcome everyone to my talk. I'm going to talk about a unified approach to the discovery of omics data, SNPs, genes, and pathways. So this is a brief outline of my research, in the past several years, I have been working on the developing statistical methods and models for large-scale data. I developed a robust statistics methods for high-dimensional data. I also developed a account-based model for unlay sequencing data. Today, I'm going to talk about the accurate testing of individual omics features and the groups of features. Here, the accurate I mean accurate p-values. So I try to um, help investigators to understand what the biology is telling us. So the applications will be um, human genetics data and the toxicology. Here is an example of the GWAS data. My methods and software can handle sleep level analysis, and uh, I can also handle gene level analysis. Analysis. Here, the pathway can be flexible definitions, and uh, we can combine SNPs, the transcription factor, binding size to the analysis. So my methods are very uh, flexible. More generally, um, here is uh, different platforms. My methods can handle, for example, for gene expression, if we can do the gene testing or pathway um, testing. For metabolomic data, we can do the uh, metabolites or the metabolic pathways. So uh, where am I going? So the problem of the existing methods and the software is they are based on the wrong assumptions. So in later slides, I'm going to give you some examples why you need my methods. Basically, um, you can use some um, accurate methods, but the existing method takes too long to get the result. And you know, I have a strong mathematical and statistical background, so um, my software can unite math with uh, biological annotation or different platform. And it is very fast and accurate. So here is an uh, example telling you the problem for testing of individual features. This is uh, um, Manhattan plot from the published paper on um, right at all 2011 nature genetics paper. And the data from the cystic fibrosis consortium is a long function phenotype. We have about 2,000 patients and about 600 uh, thousands of sleeps. And this Manhattan plot, actually, we didn't uh, take into account the sleeps with low minor audio frequency. Basically, we threw out away the SNPs, um, the high percentage, and, and uh, you know, the existing testing procedure has its own um, restrictions. So even though for the nowadays, you know, for sequencing data analysis, it's very hard to do real reference testing, but people don't have 
that you will find testing procedure to handle all the SNPs at a time. And the current approach to handle this type of problem um, is to perform standard testing and then when the result, if you don't trust the result, people argument with the permutation or the gap testing. So one solution when you um, have the inaccurate result is to using exact testing. For example, permutation is one example of do the exact testing. So this is uh, um, a very common way for us to express the data. So we have a, a matrix format each row. For example, if it's a gene expression data, each row is for each gene, and each column is for um, each and independent samples. Correspondingly, we have the clinical experiment data. Um, so the permutation means we can fix, for perfection analysis, we can fix the omics data and the permute the clinical so we can reorder this, you know, reorder them, uh, permute the data repeatedly to get the, um, the non-distribution of the statistics. And uh, um, if we do this permuting exhaustively, then it's called exact testing. But it is very time consuming. For example, you have millions of SNPs and you have n samples. You have to do millions multiplied by n factors. So that's why you need my software and methods. And the second example as motivation of my methods is um, on the pathway level testing. You know, the simple methods is invalid. For example, many people use David and Ease for the pathway analysis. This is a uh, um, software you can just dump in the um, data and get the result. But the result is spurious. It is because um, um, the assumption, statistical assumption is wrong. Many people use the uh, uh, two by two continuous table to handle, identify the enrichment in gene expression. And if you use this method, um, if you, you call it spatial exact testing or hypergeometry statistics. Then you ignore, if you use this table, it's very simple, but you ignore the correlation among all the genes. So you will get a very high false positive rate. And uh, um, one solution to get the valid testing result is through permutation. Here, when we permute the data, we have to take into account the correlation among the genes, which means um, you cannot permute across the rows. Otherwise, it destroy the correlation structure. You have to uh, fix order of the genes. The uh, Getty at all in 2010 um, examined hundreds of microbrain studies. Um, it established the error rates for the simple method. So if you use the previous two by two table, the simple methods, you will see that even after you correct for multiple pathways to the FDR control, after the correction, you still have very shocking high false but if you use permutation exact testing, it's very well controlled. But you know that this exact exact testing is very time consuming. So my method avoid this time consuming procedure but give you a very accurate result. That's why we need my method. So my role here is to give rigorous testing of biological hypothesis, especially when you have very um, small effect size and when they are high dimensional. And my methods um, as many, and can be applied for any types of omics platform. So I'm going to move to one line of my research, approximation to permutation. It's going to be divided by two modules. First one, I'm going to talk about a fish analysis, then I'm going to talk about an analytic approximation to implementation set testing. And before I move on to the next slides, I want to show you that um, it's very important to choose the statistics in a wide This slide 
Um, I promise I won't show you more formula in my later slide. This is all you want, don't worry. So I'm going to use um, two types of statistics repeatedly. Uh, first one is uh, score statistics. Essentially, this is a correlation. And here, this x could be a single row of omics data. Could be um, one snip or one gene. And it can also be the class of several features. For example, if you are doing sequencing analysis, you can count the rare reference and do the class summary across all the SNPs. So uh, another type of statistics I often use is quadratic form statistics. So for each feature I in a pathway, I compute the Z scores representing the association between the eyes of its future and the human type. Then I aggregate the sphere of Z, get this quadratic form statistics. This statistics is very useful because for different pathways, you know, um, this online, this non-distribution of Q is different. It's because the correlation of the gene is different for different pathways. So this will help us to capture the correlation structure of the genes. I'm going to use this a lot for pathway testing. Okay, as I said before, um, this omics data can often be represented as a, a matrix format. We have, uh, for example, for gene expression data, we have M features, and we have clinical variables. My, um, I developed a feature testing, for the feature testing, I developed a moment correct correlation software. And I also have BBC, which is designed for count based sequencing data. For set testing, I have quadratic form. I also have set express. This software is designed for microwave data. And uh, um, I also developed pathway seek. This is a uh, software designed for time sequencing data. And I have the corresponding, I have papers uh, for each software. You know, when this dimension goes to infinity, this is a very hot area in statistics. A high dimensional long sample size. I'm not going to talk about this today. I um, established asymptotic theory um, in HTLSS, working with statistics in statistics. So let's move to the first module for future analysis by moment web definition. So um, for per future analysis, each time we are comparing um, the rows with clinical variable, then we have uh, statistics. So we are going to have a Z statistics with a length F. If you are doing um, case control study, for example, your clinical variable is zero or one, and um, for example, you also have uh, um, omics data zero one. one you can do initial design testing or chi-square or logistics regression. If you are doing GWAS study, you have zero one one two. you can use chi-square trend test or you can use logistic regression. If you have a continuous data like this, you can use logistic regression or deep statistics. So different uh, statistics can give you different p-values for the same data. Here's an example I want to show you the problem. So I simulate um, a genotype data, one SNP, it could be a GY study, the case control study. And if we use standard methods, for example, trend tests for proportions, we get this p-value. If we use logistic regression, we have different type of p value. These p values are in different orders. So, what can we conclude here? Can we conclude association? In the genome scan, um, normally we use a cut point five 
comes in to the marketplace, but the car point to two claims in figures. So if we use different statistics, one say this thing is not significant, but this one it is. So what can we say? But if you use the exact testing, you can see that we have the same p-value. That's what I proved in one paper, which is on the revision biostatistics. Correction on coefficient is permutation, and under permutation it is equivalent to other statistics. So if we use this, then we can claim it is So that's, no, just an illustrative example to you why my method MCC is important. Implementation is distribution free, and we do not need to worry about the type of assumptions. So, for example, we don't need to normalize the data. And then we use score statistics because it is commutationally equivalent to other statistics. And the commutation distribution of the, uh, you know, the score statistics is very uh, complicated. But we can use the first, first four moments to capture the non distribution. So here, I simulated uh, uh, one feature of the omics data. We have 100 samples. So both of the, uh, both of the x and y are skewed. Corresponding statistics is also y skewed under the non distribution. Mm -hmm. If we use the mean variance um, in the shape, the skewness can capture the shape of the uh, non distribution. In the closest, um, closest is a measurement uh, to capture the highest and the you know, widest of the distribution under the norm. So if we use this all you can see that we can do a very good job for the fitting of the non distribution. And this is a histogram um, under the 100 million commuted correlation. And uh, this curve is using the big method. Uh, so we can capture the distribution very well. This is uh, you know, the core of my method MCC. So the basic idea of my method, the moment of related correlation method, is to mimic the exact testing, but it is very fast and convenient. I will say um, the trail the reason in a second. And we can do the um, millions of testing, I'll finish that in a few seconds, but with very high accuracy. And we can apply this idea to all types of data. Uh, the reason um, that MCC is very fast is because of the um, how I is the algorithm I used is using some matrix transformation so we can handle the omics data simultaneously as wise fast and we use the data itself the four, four moments of the omics data itself to capture the relation as wise accurate. So the question you may ask, why MCC is so general? Um, it is because the correlation coefficient is permutationally equivalent to other test statistics. And when do we need to consider use MCC? Um, if your clinical variable, both your clinical variable and your predictors are skewed, then MCC is much, much better than a statistic. I'm going to use the example from the statistic of practice. I'm not sure I try to understand that one here. Basically, what you try to do is actually you do permutation, not exhaustively. Calculate the first four moments and compare that one to a hypothetical exhaustive permutation to cap to equivalent to your actual calculation. 
Is that, is, is that what you think? So as an example, mm -hmm. I show you just want to tell you how accurate we are. So no, no, no. I give I'll try you to find an idea. Idea is use the moments of the data itself. Okay, use the moment of data. Mm -hmm. Compute the, the, the now. But uh, how would you know the now in the muted example? Mm, can you say your question again? I think you actually you you try to calculate the knob, right? The knob is switches. And you use the computer data. Computer I don't the first computer the data okay. at all. You just I avoid the permutation. Okay, so you just uh, you just to take the first moment of the actual data. And then to predict no, what would be the model. No, it's not that simple as you thought. We have 20 pages of panics no, 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 for no, the duration. No, 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 I try to understand what your logic is. Okay? Mm -hmm. that, 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 that's exactly what I should how, how it works. So um, you tell me in a simple sentence. Okay, let me um, pass the information to you in one sentence. It's like a, um, I use all kinds of mathematical and statistical tools to find moments of the um, moments of the long distribution, but I can convert it back to the raw data. No, all kinds of mathematics transformation. So you don't have to use the permutation at all. No, I still try to understand the, the idea, your core idea that the, how did you do it? That what was the essential idea that it would make you make such a claim? The four numbers come from Right, actual data. Okay, and now how would that relate to the mutual sample? We use correlation coefficient, and under the permutation, we can find the exact moments. And we convert, we can connect these moments with the actual data. Maybe we can continue the talk okay, and then sure, discuss sure. later because it's more technical questions. And uh, no, it's very long for the duration. I can't illustrate here simply. So um, this is an example I used from um, cystic fibrosis um, consortium. And the CF is a genetic related disease. One out of 2,500 children with European ancestry at the CF. And uh, you have to get two copies of CFTR in order to get the disease. Um, we, um, it's well known that CFTR is uh, causing uh, gene. And uh, this study, uh, we have two phases, uh, phase one, phase two. And uh, we are uh, trying to find other um, Inferential genes which can cause non-function, um, inference non-function. For the first phase, we have about 3,000 CF patients, and totally now we have about 6,000. And this is a reanalyzed example from the uh, published paper on um, Dr. Fred Wright, the uh, genetics paper for one SNPs on the chromosome 11 associated with dichotomized uh, cystic fibrosis non-phenotype. So the, this is uh, how the distribution of data look like. The x-axis is uh, uh, adjusted the genotype. We adjust the genotype by the covariate. And the y-axis is dichotomized uh, phenotype, have a, a low or high. So this is uh, uh, left skewed uh, cross bonding statistics and the now is uh, left skewed. And this histogram bar is using the exact testing. Under the law. And this gray curve is using the standard method. If you use our method, you see that uh, the feeling is very well under the now. And from the observed um, uh, value of patient condition that we can claim um, the association. Just now I show you dichotomous uh, phenotype. Now let's have a look at the original quantitative phenotype. 
the left hand side is using the plink analyzed data. Um, you can see that the plink find lots of stores information because the underlying statistics they use is uh, similar linear regression. And uh, we also notice there's a bunch of microbes right here. They are wrong. If you use MCC, you are found that these are supposed to be in the same group of that. And there's only one marker outstanding. So for the recent uh, phase two data, we have a uh, uh, family structure, uh, thin ships. The left hand side panel is showing you um, the unrelated only. And this y axis is native log campus values. The y on the right panel is the data with including the thin ships. You can see that uh, with adding the information, um, p value dropped about five volts. And MCC, uh, we already developed, uh, it's under development actually. Um, MCC can solve these small family problems. If you use GEE to consider the family structure, the re result will be anti-conservative. Um, I won't have time to show you the result. It's going to be wrong if you use GEE method. So this is a summary of moment credit correlation method. Um, it can handle millions of features, millions in seconds or minutes, and uh, we can handle covariates for quantitative trait or under stratification. And we are developing the method for continuous covariate or discrete phenotype now. This method, MCC, as um, um, this idea is very general, we can apply to real variance. So let's move to the second module, the preset analysis. Um, so this is uh, the cartoon I showed you before. For um, preset, um, for the previous module, I didn't um, emphasize the correlation among the genes because we are doing the testing one by one. But for the pathway analysis, we know the correlation is very simple. Um, it's important otherwise it's going to have a high false positive rate. Here this cartoon will show you um, pathway one, we have a, a bunch of genes, pathway two, and we can share the same features. The um, correlation structure is important and uh, um, I proposed two statistics, basically both of them are um, the quadratic form of statistics they are very useful. This Q is often used uh, in self-contained hypothesis when you focus on one pathway at a time. Uh, this D um, is for competitive hypothesis. Um, it is very <laughs> useful and important because you can um, take into account all the structure of the data. Um, well, D can be <coughs> presented as a contrast between that new pathway and uh, the remaining pathways. If you do exhaustive permutation, it is um, impossible to do that because normally you have 10,000 pathways. And then for each pathway, you do um, n factorials of permutation. It's just uh, not doable, so we need a method to avoid the permutation, but also give you the accurate uh, statistical results. The take home message is we can approximate the distribution of the uh, Q statistics and D using the exact ones, and we can um, calculate the accurate p values for a thousand pathways within 10 minutes. example, I want to show you how accurate we are. This is data coming from cystic fibrosis. And we have um, 
77 SNPs near the gene EPIP. This is a full uh, gene lab analysis. We can also do that for the pathway now, level analysis. See, the idea is very general, just you know, uh, depending on how you define your pathway. And this, this histogram bar is under um, millions of permutations. And the feeding is using our method, very accurate, especially on the tail part. This idea, quantitative form ideas, um, can be applied on um, other types of omics data, for example, RNA sequencing data. But uh, we need to transform the count data so that it can be fit to the framework of this. using our method. 
our method give a stronger relation, point seven one. So here each point is for each pathway. If we use the same p value, take the maybe log ten, you will visually you will see more correlation. This basically it's the same p value, just a different scale. We see more correlation. And we are, we are very interested in uh, the pathways, this group, for both of the correlation is strong. It's about lipid breakdown, and uh, some of them are about um, oxidative stress, and some of them are about um, the neuro-related pathways. Um, we are also interested in some pathways which are um, very strong related to PCE dose, but not with the PC. And also, interest we are investigating the pathways strongly associated with PCE dose, but not with PCE. So, And uh, we can handle covariates um, by visualization of the data or stratification of the data. Now our software um, is very fast and accurate. Here I want to use one minute to talk about my submitted grant RTD1 to NIH. I try to pull the best and the pathway best uh, testing in one single framework. And uh, I um, Propose several novel statistical methods in how to handle the small family structures of the data. Um, I have a strong collaborators, for example, in UNC, um, Pat Sullivan or Terry Ferry. They produce, uh, they're going to help me to produce uh, the um, a comprehensive annotation. So um, basically, we have, if we are given a set of clinical variable data and the genomics data. And uh, we need a bounding to support us uh, to uh, get a comprehensive annotation. No, um, Kagan and Go, uh, people normally use the annotation file or SNP functional annotation. Um, we're trying to combine that with the uh, g-text annotation um, to build all this into a <coughs> And uh, um, the software can be um, um, very unified to all types of data and get comprehensive results in a very fast way. Uh, we try to write that in the glass in this as well. So this is um, the other examples of my methods and used for G-text and study. It's about uh, um, genotype tissue expression. <laughs> I may not have enough time to describe more, but um, I can talk to you if you're interested in that. Basically, um, this is a very large EQDL study because we are testing billions, we are doing billions of testing, comparing millions of SNPs with thousands of genes. That's why MCC is critical, because we are fast and accurate. We can handle this type of large-scale testing. And another uh, extension to the pathway idea um, is that um, uh, you, we can help you to use the uh, historical data to um, get the correlation structure and then um, calculate, provide you the gene-based analysis result in a very fast way. We can talk about this later if um, some of you are interested in this idea. Um, another idea uh, we used is for the hydrogen study in the um, Godot twin transcriptomic study. We um, found we can um, 
find a very interesting genes related to evolution, um, extra genes. We use uh, our flexible pathway and uh, uh, find the uh, very um, uh, they are informative in terms of heritability. And the bunch of genes near the highly significant steps in the NIGRI GWAS catalog, uh, those disease related genes are also more heritable. So the pathway idea of my uh, algorithm can be applied to um, in a general way and in several other important <coughs> projects. So this is uh, my collaborator, Dr. Fred Wright, and uh, uh, William Berry, who is uh, working in Harvard now, and Dr. Mike Knowles, um, um, cystic fibrosis data come from him, and Dr. Elon Wilson um, for the toxicology study. Thank you, everyone. Corresponds to the null distribution we get if you're permuting it. So, how do you, I guess, get from the four moments to the null distribution? Like how do you, is the, are you saying the variance is equivalent from the original data to the null distribution? Or do you, how do you take the so four moments and then get a null distribution? Everything is not the same. So, I um, equation was equivalent to other statistics for them because that's my equation statistics. Um, I have other slide, but not here. Um, it's more like a in a view of statistician to show you why that's equivalent. But in terms of uh, the readings, um, so here I just tell you that the moments of the data itself, <coughs> right? Why is that? Right? But behind this, I have uh, 10 or 20 pages how to link this with the statistics itself. threshold here is to tell you different statistics, may give you different conclusion. Um, basically, um, I'm not telling, uh, I, I think uh, uh, the question would be different. You, you, if you use our method, you don't need to worry about the threshold too much because it's accurate to the, at least 10 to the negative 8. Oh, I wouldn't have any genes in my system, the threshold. That's okay. So any other people can help me to address the question better, maybe? So you need to worry about the fact that genes are correlated, right? You test gene one, and you test gene two, but, 
right? So then if you do two tests, then you should do multiple testing adjustment for two tests. But if they're correlated, then maybe you don't need to adjust for two tests, maybe you only need to adjust for 1.3 tests. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what Robert's asking. Is can we lower our threshold because genes are Is it related to the how to do the adjustment? Like and, uh, in and our studies, we, we use operation identifying spot. That's about the best thing we can do. But all the genes grow short of non genetic weapons from but then we do that in our software, we have the advantage that we can actually have mutants to later test and establish an empirical false discovery rate. And at that level, that remains a point about 80% or so of genes that validate. And uh, I think part of that is that, first of all, these are the top genes in that limited population, but also that there is this enormous correlation structure. And in fact, years ago, uh, maybe there were people here, I think, we were in, uh, at the meeting, I think Japan must have been there, in, in Edinburgh, when they had the con International Quantitative Genetics Conference, and Eric Lander talked there. And Eric Lander actually advocated to look below the conventional uh, cutoff threshold uh, thinking, or, or um, you know, arguing that there's a lot of information that we normally throw out, that we lose, by being too conservative. Do you take correlation into consideration? For the population analysis um, here, I think because we are doing the testing independently for the population analysis, um, for after we get the um, p values, we do the Bunforming correction, or Bunforming is a little bit conservative, um, Benjamin Herbert correction for the p values as necessary. But we without adjusting, so you don't use an effective number of genes, for yeah. example. Yeah, just use the number of genes. Right. And the, I don't measure that only just the, actually, the p-value of per So as to and how to and interpret that p-value, that's different questions. So you include, that's interesting. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> you don't adjust the threshold. Okay, thank you. And still under development, so if you have very, no, inside or um, thought, we, we can do that. I think Robert's got some insight. <laughs> Are these packages available for download on in R? MCC is available on I think on R. Yes, and then on um, Safe Express is on my website, and also uh, EPC is there too. I think Quadratic Form is on um, on R Crime as well. Most of them are free. Actually, all of them are free. <laughs> Three quick questions actually. Uh, the first one, uh, you are mentioning that you are working with a new project involving millions of SNPs. In your opinion, is it like a trend that will uh, continue in the coming years, like working with more and more and more bigger and bigger and bigger data sets, especially like the bigger sets of SNPs? How do you see that evolving in the future? Handle in the big data area. Is there, so, so what's, what's the rational? Uh, you, you were mentioning that example is uh, stick fibrosis, uh, where you get like half a million SNPs, and now, now you are working with a data set involving 10 million SNPs. What is the the benefit of this genre in terms of this, like, a wonderful? Or like a but, like, what's the big benefit for the analysis? So, Moving from half a million steps to 10 In terms of the view of the community or in terms of you using that software? So, Not so the software, in terms of like what, in terms of the outcomes of the, of the study. So, of course, like, as the increasing of the dimension, um, lots of issues have to take into account because when the um, dimension and um, approach to infinity, then we can use the asymptotics theorem to make the, you know, save the computing time and uh, Sure, but it's, it's not what I ask. But I ask if the, the biological significance, like if I have half a million of snakes, or if I have 20 million of snakes, does uh, the potential biological outcome, the type of snakes that you're going to be able to discover, is it more valuable? Is it more relevant? Oh, you are asking. Uh, biology perception. Yes. Yeah. So I think uh, 
uh, many people already established, like uh, have some useful findings, not more the better. Actually, like uh, some rare variants are more informative about disease, right? Not a common variants. It's been studied for many years. So. Uh, another, uh, another question related to the study that you're doing with uh, Eva Luzi, right? In, uh, in Texas. So you are putting this to uh, a mouse. Sorry? Mouse? Yeah. 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 We don't have a solid threshold to claim which one is significant, but we are we are trying to use this genome study to try to understand the biology of PCE and you know learning the information from the TCE. We're trying to connect them. That's why you know I show you the pathway correspondence. I agree. I agree. But yeah. uh, is this number in your opinion? So so we uh, of course because like. Uh, Significant um, after the um, multiple correction of the passwords. Okay. Yeah. And uh, the last question is related to the fact. So you said that you are uh, using velocity regressions or uh, the other uh, uh, standard uh, linear regression. Can you describe in two or three sentences, I think it uh, corresponds to, to uh, your question as well, what is the actual Workflow. How do you uh, derive your velocity regression based on this uh, one gene a set of samples? So I, I start to understand you're doing a lot of fitting, but how do you validate this regression? If you remove 10 samples out of this 400 or 500, how does it uh, modify, for example, the coefficients of the, of the regression? It's a little technical, I know, but. Uh, how the sample size will influence the accuracy? Yes, and how does it um, perturbate the actual result, the actual regression equation that you are deriving, that you are fitting? Oh, I'm not using regression, plain regression. Yes, but yes. so you said that you are, uh, uh, well, you said that you can use logistic regression, or linear regression. So if you, if you decrease, if you uh, remove a couple of samples from your, from your vector, does it modify the results? Of course, so it's uh, different sample size, so without a different correlation, it would be different too. Yes. Is it significant? It depends on the data itself. So. Well, uh, I was charged with keeping this under an hour, and it's, well, it's getting near the hour mark. I just want to maybe suggest that, uh, first of all, thanks, speaker, again. And, <laughs> More technical discussions be conducted offline with uh, eBay now or or later. All right. Thank you.